Lord took hold of me, and I was carried away by the Spirit of the Lord to the valley filled with bones. He led me around, all around the bones that were covering the valley floor. They were scattered everywhere across the ground, and they were completely dried out. Then he asked me, Son of man, can these bones become living people again? O sovereign Lord, I replied, you alone know the answer to that. Then he said to me, Speak a prophetic message to these bones and say, Dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. And this is what the sovereign Lord says, Look, I'm going to put breath into you and make you live again. I will put flesh and muscle on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath into you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I spoke this message just as he told me. Suddenly as I spoke, there was a rattling noise across the valley. The bones of each body came together and attached themselves as complete skeletons. Then as I watched, muscles and flesh formed over the bones. Then skin formed over to cover their bodies, but they still had no breath in them. Then he said to me, Speak a prophetic message to the winds of the Son of Man. Speak a prophetic message and say, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Come, O breath from the four winds. Breathe into these dead bodies so that they may live again. So I spoke the message as commanded me, and breath came into their bodies. They all came to life. They stood up on their feet, a great army. Then he said to me, Son of Man, these bones represent the people of Israel. They are saying, we have become old and dry bones. All our hope is gone. Our nation is finished. Therefore, prophesy to them and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Oh, my people, I will open your gates of exile and cause you to rise again. Then I will bring you back to the land of Israel. When this happens, oh, my people, you will know that I am the Lord. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live again and return home to your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken. And I have done what I said. Yes, the Lord has spoken. Praise God. As Paul Harvey said, then that's the rest of the story. Stand with me this morning, if you will. Is that powerful? So the question is, can these dead bones rise again? Can these dry bones of... But yes, they can. Exactly. The word of the Lord. Speak the word of the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you this morning for your word that is alive and well. And this on Pentecost Sunday, we know that your spirit, as it came upon the 120 in the upper room, and they spoke in power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost and the power of the Holy Ghost flowed upon them and they went out and became testimonies and witnesses of your great power. We need that power today. Amen. We need that power at Bethel Christian Center today. Not next week, not last year, but today. God, move, Father, on our bones, Father, this morning. God, help us not to go and say, oh, I'm old. I can't do what I used to do. God, help us to know that the anointing, when it comes upon us, we can do all things. We can run through a troop and jump over a mountain. God, because you do the work for your glory, because you said, look, the Lord, I have spoken. Speak the word over us this morning, God. Let your anointing fall over this congregation. Let the Holy Ghost flow over us this Pentecost Sunday. And may we bring honor to your glorious name. And everyone said, amen. 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 If you will, join us this morning and let us worship the Lord our God. Oh! 
You are good to us. You give us breath that fills our lungs, Lord. And this morning, as we sing to you, we know that this is the breath of God. Yes, God. Yes, Lord. We have your breath in our lungs. Yes, God. And we worship you with our whole hearts this morning. You are a good, good Father. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my daily bread. This is my daily bread, your very word, spoken to me this is, this is the air I breathe, this is the
you are a good God and we need you every morning, every afternoon and every evening when we lie down and when we rise up. And God, we thank you for meeting us in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. It is good to be in the house of the Lord with you this morning. I have the honor of coming to take uh, the tithes and the offerings here. Um, at Bethel. So if you are an usher and you've got your plate, if you will go ahead and come forward. And as you hold your seed, as you hold your offering in your hand or your tithe or as you're giving online this morning, um, we just want to bless it, that God would multiply it and that would be used for his kingdom, for his glory and for his power forever and ever in Jesus name. Amen. <laughs> So God, we thank you this morning for who you are. God, we thank you that we know that you are a multiplier and that you can take our little, you can take our lack, and you can make something good out of it. So God, we pray that this seed that we plant this morning, God, will go forth to spread the gospel to those who need to know it. God, that hearts and lives would be changed and that they would be transformed by the power of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Uh, it's good to be in the house of the Lord with you. Um, as I have said before, my name is Christy. I am one of the youth leaders here at Bethel, and it is just good to see you here on this holiday weekend, this Memorial Day weekend, and this Pentecost Sunday. There's a lot going on, um, and we are so thankful uh, that you have decided to join us at Bethel this morning. I do have um, just a few announcements. Uh, the first is we will be having a CPR techniques and AED education at 9 and at 1 p.m. on June the 10th, which is a Saturday. If you are somebody that works with children um, or if you are somebody that works really with people at all, <laughs> which is all of us, right, this is a great thing to come to. It's not a certification class, but it is where you can learn about these techniques on both children as well as adults. Um, so if this is something that you are interested in, there is a sign-up sheet that is in uh, the foyer on the Welcome Center. Uh, that next Sunday on June 11th, we are going to be having our baptism and our new members class. 
I'm sorry, welcome at the church. So they've been through the class, um, and then we are excited to get people baptized and get people members of this church and serving the Lord um, as they are already doing um, here for our church. So if you are interested in being baptized, there is a sign-up sheet in the Welcome Center that you can take a look at um, and put your name down on, and we'll have somebody reach out to you and talk to you a little bit about what that baptism means. On uh, June 18th, it's a very special day because we get to honor all of the fathers in our lives. Um, so we are going to have a Father's Day breakfast at 9.30 um, prior to church on the 18th. So the men were so good to us as mothers <laughs> and as women um, in cooking a fabulous breakfast. So we're going to figure something out, men, and try to make it just as special and as good for you um, and honor you that day because you surely deserve to be honored. And then finally, on your bulletin, there are a lot of camps um, and things coming up for children. Um, one of those being our VBS soccer camp. It's going to be Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. Um, we're going to have a collegiate athlete come in from UNC and run those camps for us. Um, I will be running the little kids soccer camp. So if you have kids that are, you know, three and under, I can have them. And uh, then the bigger kids will get to go with this collegiate athlete. But we're so excited about that. We're going to share the good news of the gospel as we play soccer, right? As we, what we're doing, we're going to glorify the Lord. So make sure that you do um, get that on your calendar. Invite your neighbors. Invite um, anybody there. And make sure to sign up so that we know if you're coming or not. Um, there are other announcements on there that are, are for those kids, especially youth camp. So if you're interested in coming to youth camp at Camp Dixie, what a, a move that the Lord does at that camp when a bunch of teenagers get together um, and worship God. So just make sure that you take a look at that bulletin and see what we've got there. Um, we are uh, going to hear from my husband this morning, from Michael Britt, uh, as Larry, Pastor Larry, is uh, out of town this weekend. So with that, if you'll welcome my husband. Thank you very much. I, I do want to say uh, briefly to those announcements, uh, Pastor Larry had mentioned, if you work with kids, the CPR class is definitely a good thing to sign up for, um, whether here at the church or just in general. And then specifically that nine o'clock class is the one that you want to target because if there's, you know, so many, uh, if we don't have as many people sign up, it would definitely be good to only have the one offering. So sign up for the nine o'clock and then I think it's 11 o'clock, but whatever the case, that second offering they won't even have depending on uh, the amount of people that we have. So, but yeah, this morning it's, a, it's a, such a privilege. Welcome. It's, a, it's an amazing privilege to be able to stand before you not just on this Memorial Day weekend, but also it being Pentecost Sunday. Uh, very excited to preach to you from God's Word. But first, if you would allow me an opportunity just to kind of spend some time with the Memorial Day tribute of sorts. Um, it's, it's funny because my working knowledge of Memorial Day, typically, you know, Christy's always on me about, okay, you can't wear this, and no more corduroy, no more flannel, all, you know, all these things, right? <laughs> and uh, whatever the rules are, are, are what they are. But when you look at the history of this, this his, the date of this goes back to 1971 as far as it actually being a holiday, but it really goes much farther back than that, even with Decoration Day and, and decorating and honoring those that have uh, passed on, especially those that have served in wars and given their lives for the freedoms that we are so thankful for. And as I was looking at this, uh, just reading about the Gettysburg Address and the Civil War, where much of this dates back to, uh, it's, it's amazing that on that day that is well known for uh, what President Lincoln said, there was someone that spoke for two hours without notes. He was the, the keynote speaker that day, and he later on told uh, President Lincoln that, you know, what he had written down and prepared and spoken in two minutes was so much <laughs> better than, you know, than what he was able to communicate. So I promise you I will not speak for two hours today. That is a, that is a definite. Um, but what I will say, too, is it was just interesting to note I had seen some things online and that in that Gettysburg address, this, this nation under God was mentioned. And even now, it's, it's amazing how sometimes that will be uh, replayed or reworked, and they'll leave that part out without even acknowledging that was there. That was the original, which would be later put into the pledge in the 50s, and of course, you know, gained some controversy over that, over that notion. But I believe there's something to be said for just trusting God with all that we've been given, and so giving honor where honor is due. This morning, I do have a uh, brief um, Video before you cue that, Alex. Uh, Hebrews eleven thirty eight speaks of the martyrs of the faith, and while I know there's a distinction to be made uh, with those that give their life for 
You know, the gospel is certainly something to be said, too, of, of men of whom the world are not worthy. So many of us are so privileged to have no clue of what it's like to serve in any kind of a capacity when it comes to a world war or even our military understanding is just very different from what the older generations grew up with. So I want to say thank you. Uh, certainly the world is not worthy of, of so much that has happened before us, laying the groundwork for the freedoms that we just take for granted. So if you would, Alex, do please play that video. Amen and amen. In case you can't read that last, that last line, our flag does not fly because the wind blows it. It flies with the last breath of every soldier who died defending it. And while we don't know who wrote that, it is definitely a sentiment that um, I think is poignant and can, we can echo today. And this morning, the title of my sermon is The Wind of Life. We know about the breath of life, and this morning, as we have already heard with Ezekiel, uh, the wind that blew into the dry bones. Um, if you would actually go ahead, um, Alex, and stick up John 20 and 22. The main thought here, the things that my transition point, tying all this all together, and we'll look some more at this passage uh, in a little bit. But after this, he said this, Jesus speaking on and, and speaking to the disciples, he breathed on the disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So again, we're given this picture throughout the scripture of the scripture as wind, as breath, of course as fire, we see the rain and the rivers of living water. But this morning, I just want to kind of lean into this concept of, of what God does and how he works the mystery. I, I was telling Chrissy, I was preparing for this, I was like, it's so hard to grasp the wind. She's like, yeah, literally. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's one of those things where this is something that has just been kind of a a burden of mine to, to preach this morning, uh, kind of what God does. And with that being said, 1 Thessalonians 1 and 5. Of course, this is not just me. I, I think part of my, almost like a vexation for um, preaching to you this morning is I know all that I would like to accomplish this morning, really I can do none of it. This is a, this is a work of the Holy Spirit in and of itself. Everything we do in this building, in our lives for the kingdom, is something that God has to accomplish. And so this morning, I pray this verse over our time in, in that our gospel did not come to you merely in words, but in power and in the Holy Spirit. With deep conviction, surely you recall the character that was displayed and we came among you. This is the good thing about being in a body of believers. You know me, at least most of you that have been here for some time. And it's just good to be able to do this together. But then also we know that we're not depending on just eloquent words. 
right? To see that the power of God is working in your heart and that ultimately the sword of the Spirit will pierce for his glory this morning. Amen. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you, Lord, that you are on the throne, that you're high and lifted up. God, and we declare, Lord, who you are today in this place. God, we set forth your word. God, and we as your people, we bask in it. We attempt to be good Bereans, Lord, and to go through your word. God, to see, Lord, that you have called us with a purpose. Lord, that you have not only called us, God, and sent us out empty-handed, Lord, but you have equipped us with power from on high. Lord, that you have literally breathed the breath of life into us. And so this morning we receive that. We thank you for the, the fact that you've done all the hard work and you carry us along the way. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, this morning, it is Pentecost Sunday. And Acts 2, which typically is your Pentecost sermon text, many of you are familiar with that passage. I will at least look at Acts 2 and verse 1 now, but we won't go through the the weighty chapter, some 40 verses in that. But certainly, at the very beginning of Acts chapter 2, verse 1, we know of it as the day of Pentecost had come. Now, the disciples were all together in the one place, and there comes a rushing mighty wind. The disciples begin to speak in tongues. They begin to glorify the name of the Lord. Jews that had come from all over, that had gathered in Jerusalem to worship on this day of Pentecost, heard them in their own languages, and they were shocked. They were amazed. Some were upset. Some said it sounded like a drunken mess. There was a lot of controversy that went on. But Peter got up, this one that was just, you know, the, the outcast head of the church that had fallen, like, what are you doing? What's wrong with you, Peter? Jesus restores him. He gets up, and in the power and boldness of the Spirit, preaches, and that day, thousands came to know the Lord. Amen. That is Pentecost. That is what we know. But there's so much that goes into that for us, and people try to kind of take away different portions of it and say, well, well that was just for initial kind of offset, and then God kind of stepped back. I believe, and this church stands for the fact that what happened that day is something that is ongoing until Jesus returns. This is the power that the church is to operate. Amen? Amen. So, this morning, I think the fact that we're not going to spend as much time in this chapter is more so just to highlight the fact that what Jesus is doing here for us and hopefully to make it very relatable for you. But that being said, some of you would be curious about what is Pentecost in of itself, and I just wanted to at least to spend a little time this morning on that. So if you would look with me to Leviticus, we're going to jump Old Testament and spend a little bit of time here at the very front end. Leviticus 23 and 15 reads as follows. You must count for yourselves seven weeks from the day after the Sabbath. Seven weeks. Y'all got that? From the day you bring the wave offering sheaf, they must be complete weeks. And the next verse specifically says you must count 50 days. I'm going to say 50 until the day after the seventh Sabbath, and then you must present a new grain offering to the Lord. So back in that time, Easter would have been, just like now, seven weeks ago. And so tomorrow actually would have been the Pentecost celebration. And it's interesting when you try to look at this, it can be a potentially a little bit confusing. Uh, Feast of Harvest, Feast of Weeks, is actually the name of the festival that would start. And then, of course, the day of Pentecost. Okay, so these are all different names. You can find some of that in Exodus 23 and 16. Certainly there was an association with the harvest of wheat. And this, this time period between May and June is when this would have always fallen, again, based on the agricultural calendar, equinoxes, and all these kind of things. So, and really, there's this concept of first fruits, which I will spend even less time on today. But really what I believe for our sake, this is kind of a first fruits passage where Jesus breathed on a disciple. I had, called, I had seen it read before of like the Joannine, the where John writes about Pentecost. We know that John didn't write anything about the history of the church, but he was one of the last ones to write. So he certainly knew about all this, and this is just kind of him tipping his hand to, oh, by the way, there's something else you don't know about what happened that Easter evening that morning. Uh, And then, specifically for us, before we leave the Leviticus passage, I don't know if many of you have to go to work tomorrow. I pray not too many of you, but those of you that have the day off, think of it as kind of a blessing, because in verse 21, Leviticus 23 and 21, special blessing they had a sacred assembly and there was to be no one working on that day so again consider an extra special joy this year and with that being said within the old testament tradition and the way things were kind of taught on and celebrated there was always something tied to remembrance with any kind of a festival and best we can tell the timing of this is tied back to exodus 19 and 1 where it says in the third month 
after the Israelites went out from the land of Egypt on the very day they came to the desert of Sinai. So there's a, there's a tie to the law and the giving of the law when it comes to Pentecost. Now, I got excited when I read that because I'm familiar with Jeremiah 31 and 33, speaking of the new covenant. And we know that what Jesus does in Jeremiah 31 and 33, he's taking the law and he's putting it on our heart and on our mind. So while back then this was a remembrance of what God did with the law, now we can say, okay, as God's spirit-filled people, we're not someone that's religiously just trying to follow all the rules. We're someone that's in touch with our creator. We're filled with his power, and now we are walking according to the spirit. And the whole concept of following God's law is just something that becomes natural to us. Amen. All right. Let's look at our passage. John 20. 19 to 23. On the evening of that day, this is Easter, the evening of Easter. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the disciples had gathered together and locked the doors of the place because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. Some of you catch the gravity of that. They were in a locked room, and Jesus came to them and said, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus says to them again, Peace be with you. Just as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And after he said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you retain anyone's sins, they are retained. So this morning as we go through this and break this down, this is something that I want to acknowledge a couple things up, up front. The apologetic weight of this is immense. The fact that the resurrection is what our entire hope is built on, right? This is not an apologetic sermon this morning, but I want to acknowledge that. As well, Thomas was not in the room. If you keep reading, you'll see that right after this is when Thomas is, is told about this. He doesn't believe. He's like, oh, if I could just see him. And God, in his great grace and bountiful mercy, lets Thomas see him and go through the same revelation that the others had just experienced. Okay, so you have these other facets that are kind of tied around this as well. But when we look at this again, the weight of what we see here is incredible just from the setting of Resurrection Sunday. And then specifically with the Holy Spirit, I believe, and I don't know, there's maybe not a ton for me to tell you to jot down today. Feel free to take any notes that you happen to feel as uh, poignant to, to write down. But a couple of things I want just to bring out from us today with this concept of the baptism and the Holy Spirit. And so you can just jot these down. Confidence. There's this thing that we struggle with. I won't spend as much time on it today. Next time, or in about a month or so, I'll, I'll maybe touch on this preaching on Christian liberty. This idea of control. A lot of times people get really nervous or scared when they come to this, right? You have the, you have the confidence. People come like, not worthy enough. Then you have the, you worry about the, well, people are going to get too crazy, right? You have that side of things. So there's a sense of control, and I would almost call it cooperation, that God's wanting us to have a sense of cooperation about this. And then the call. This is not something that's a coercive thing. This is really, I mean, it, it shouldn't be a take it or leave it, but I'll read you something from Jack Hayford eventually that just shows you so well. This is something that is not a hill to die on within the church. It's something that I'm very passionate about, but it's one of those things where it's like, okay, if we're not going to get on board with this, then we're just going to let it alone. Right, The call is something, and this is why I wanted to bring this up now. Jesus is always calling us to himself. I believe one of the reasons that John wrote this down through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit was he remembered this happening, and he said, this has to be known, this has to be passed on, because Jesus himself is the center of this. We know from the Gospels, we know from Acts, that he is the baptizer of the Holy Spirit. And there's nothing that he does without the Father, and there's nothing the Holy Spirit does that out, is outside of Christ. Literally, the whole way we can determine what is Antichrist through 1 John's writings and the letters is does it proclaim that Jesus is who he said he was? So there's this unity here. 
And for Jesus to breathe on them in this moment, he's saying, look, this is coming from me, right? This is another one of those God moments where the only context in why he would breathe on them is because he's God. It's totally weird and doesn't make any sense from the human side of it, right? But as God, it makes total sense. We know in John 7, he stood up and said, anyone who wants to drink, let, if you're thirsty, let him come to me. Out of him will flow rivers of living water, right? He's calling people to himself. He's saying that he is the fount. He is the fount. And from Jesus, all of this will flow. This is something I think even as a seasoned believer, it can be a very big challenge because it's so often that we get caught up in the gifts and the manifestations and the things that come up along the way that we forget about the source and the simple truth of the gospel. And that's something that underrides all of this at all times forever. And we're to constantly be walking in the power of the Spirit, remembering that the power of the resurrection is still the power of the Spirit. So, on this morning, I want to just really try to make this clear for, for each of you. John 7 and 39, speaking of the rivers of living water, John gives us another kind of note here. It says, now this is about the Spirit. Those who believed in him, the disciples that were right there, they were going to receive, for the Spirit had not yet been given at that point. While he was walking and doing ministry, the Spirit had not yet been given. For, because, or rather, Jesus was not yet glorified. Well, now in John 20, Jesus is glorified. The fact that he could walk through a wall, that doesn't make any sense to me, but he was still human. He showed them his side. He sat and had a meal with them later with Thomas. He was still human, right? He's in this glorified resurrection body that one day we'll get to experience and understand more fully. But right now we just look to that and say, thank you, Jesus. And the Spirit had not yet been poured out at Pentecost, but it had been given now. I believe this is kind of the first fruits of that Pentecost moment where for the first time, perhaps, they were now indwelt with the Holy Spirit. And the way anyone that places their faith in Jesus is now filled with the Holy Spirit and the fact that you have Christ on the inside of you, that's something that doesn't have to be, you know, fully understood. It doesn't have to be miraculous in the sense of us being able to, like, take it to a doctor and have him sign off. Yep, that's a miracle. It's something that we just accept. We take it. And it's funny, in the office, we've been talking a few different things. We've had a New Beginnings class with some great questions that came up. And I know it was, it was mentioned, you know, can God work a gift or something going on outside of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And kind of the consensus was, yeah, sure, you know. And then it's kind of like, well, you know, it doesn't really fit in our little theological box, right? But the cool thing about this is you think about the disciples— they had already worked miracles with Jesus having been sent out prior to this happening. Amen? So God can do what he wants to do. In my estimation, they were operating like an Old Testament prophet where the Spirit would come and come upon them, even though they were not indwelt by the Spirit. And look, it's not all roses, right? I, I'm, one of the things I want to teach this morning is the fact that Jesus, when he's baptized in, the whole, baptized in the water, the Holy Spirit comes down, and in that baptism moment, we're to look to him as our lead even in this regard. Now, again, it's not all roses. He was led from that moment into the wilderness. And just this past Wednesday night, we talked about the baptism of suffering, right? And there's this idea of taking up your cross and following him. So it's amazing how there's this tension. You can have the power of the Holy Spirit and see signs and wonders and still know we're going to suffer for our Lord. How does that work out? I don't know, but I know, I know it works out. Amen. Like I know that is what we are called to as a believer, to know that when the going gets tough, some, something to be said for Paul and Philippians saying, I'm going to be content in all things. Right? You can do whatever you want to me, but I will not deny my Lord. So, this morning, this concept of, of baptism, and I do want to mention, for those that are getting baptized, uh, we're only like two weeks out from that. So, it's an exciting thing, but I want you to know that in baptism, our church is really big on the symbol side of baptism and communion, but that doesn't mean that there's nothing else going on there, right? If it was literally just a symbol, like, we wouldn't do it. Like, that, that, you know, what's the point of just wasting our time with traditions and blah, 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 right? So God's still working something powerful in these moments, but it's a mystery to us, right? We can't understand how this all works. From God's perspective, it's very, very clear. I want to read you something, again, I mentioned from Jack Hayford. 
uh, Alex, if you put up 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. Pastor Don turned me on to Jack Hayford, I don't know, 10 years ago, maybe more. And it's one of those things where I grew up in the Pentecostal movement. Uh, my dad was a tent revival product and one of the little kids that sang all over the state in the 50s. And it was just kind of, you know, it's what he, he knew. His, his mother was converted from a Jehovah's Witness and was on fire. Uh, one of the big reasons that I'm standing before you today was, you know, the John 1, 1 and 9, uh, it was in a book where she had highlighted where I went to college and, you know, came back to that and was like, God is good, you know? <laughs> um, but it's, it's something that I had never heard taught about, just something that I grew up, kind of took it for granted. Uh, if it's for me, God will hit me on the head. And apparently that's not exactly how God works, right? God doesn't take everyone and treat him like Saul on Damascus. Uh, so for us today, I think there's some, there's some levity that sometimes can be helpful to look at these things. I found this in the note next to 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. Hayford writes about this verse, which is in the very middle of some wonderful chapters. If you want to read more about this, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, fantastic uh, references to run into. He talks about how the Greek grammar here actually parallels perfectly with all the other baptism of the Holy Spirit verses from the Gospels and from Acts. And specifically, while spirit baptism describes a primary spiritual reality for all believers, Paul still pleads for a spirit-filled experience. So again, it's something in theory we can talk about and accept that yes, God's spirit indwells and there's this unity among everyone who proclaims Christ but the experience itself is something that we are to long for and long for others to experience because it is a powerful it is an encouraging it's such a wonderful gift that we're to walk in we're to accept with open arms and to not question the giver all right the challenge the challenge if you would look with me briefly to John 3 you are familiar with the, the passage John 3 Just specifically in verse 8, he's talking to John's uh, recounting a time that Jesus spoke with Nicodemus on this idea of salvation and being born again. This is a work of the Spirit we do not understand. Speaking of which, he describes it, Jesus compares it to the wind. The wind blows wherever it will, and you can hear the sound it makes, but you do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. At some point in prepping for this, I was sitting at my computer at the house, and I think the front door was open. I don't know if the kids, Christy, who all was home. But at some point, the back door opened. And I didn't hear anything. It was a calm day. But in about three or four minutes, that front door slammed. And once I got up to make sure it wasn't a child with a finger chopped off or whatever was happening... I said, okay, it was the wind. Because I know, you know, the simple thing, you've probably experienced it when you open up something and you get a kind of a draft, low pressure system, and boom, something shuts. And the wind wasn't even blowing that hard, but you could sure feel the effect. That's how it is with things of the Spirit. Sometimes God so gently is doing something and the impact is so powerful. I can tell you, when God turned my life around, I was at a, a conference, a, a witnessing one of those are direct evangelism things where I think I talked to one guy named Kyle and who knows if he ever even heard me because the alcohol consumption or whatever. But um, I was ministered to that day. And I remember the final night of that conference, a uh, Baptist preacher, Rob Hershey, was, what his name was, uh, preaching a lot of Lord of the Ring references and I hadn't even heard any of this kind of stuff. You know, it's just one of those things where I don't even know how it happened, but God moved in that time where I just surrendered my life to him, and I had a single tear. I was sitting on the very edge, this is a you know, big machoistic man, sitting here at the, the edge of my pew, or whatever kind of seats we had. All the guys that I was with were on the other end, so I was on the edge, and like, I had that one tear that ran out. Nope, get, nope, nope. Get, nobody even saw it, but in that moment, it was just unbelievable, the change that had taken place in my heart. And I don't understand that, right? None of the individual, I'm sitting here recounting to you, none of those individual factors seem that powerful, but I know what God did. And so even though I don't understand all this stuff, I know that God works. 
I know that he's the one that accomplishes it to his glory. 1 Corinthians 2, uh, Brother Matt on a Friday nights or so had mentioned just the mystery of God and how if they, in, in verse 8 it says, they would not have crucified, crucified the Lord of glory had they known. This gospel is mysterious, but the fact that the gospel works is so plain. We know John 3, 16, just right after the verses on the, the wind, we know that the gospel was given to Nicodemus, and it's something that we've seen put on athletic material, we've seen put all over. It's just such a simple understanding of the fact that for God so loved the world that anyone would just believe on him. How much easier could it be, right? They would not perish, but they would have eternal life. And probably some of you would have wondered if I would have read this or not. Genesis 2 and 7. Alex, if you put that up. This is the first thing you've got to think of when you think about John. And I'm saving it to now because I don't want to just make it just about the breath. But literally when he's breathing on the disciples, this is what our minds to go to. Genesis 2 and 7. The Lord God formed the man from the soil of the ground. Adam, the first person, is just being made to life. But he's like those pe people, right? The, the army with no breath in them. But God breathes into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man becomes a living being. 1 Corinthians 15 and 45 says this comparison between Adam and Jesus in a different way. So as the first Adam became a living person, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Hallelujah. We know that in Romans that through one man's death, right, we all died. But at the same time now, the fact that one man lives, we can have life. Amen. This is a beautiful thing. This is something that I think is pointed to with, with what I had Brother Denny read off the top. We won't take much time on that passage now. The passage of the dry bones, yes, it's about Israel, but I think the church should grab onto that as well and not let that promise escape without us having a hand in it too. Because I think the church, we have a, we have a big part to play, right? Certainly Israel has, has a great promise, but I know the church is something where we can see the Gentile promise played out in the, in the world. And even last week, we were talking about how you know sometimes you wrestle with God's work and how it all works out. As I was looking at Ezekiel 36, the chapter right before that, something kind of struck me powerfully. He says that I'll give you a new heart. I'll put a new spirit within you. Remove the heart of stone from the heart of flesh. Well, did you know three times this is talked about in Ezekiel? If you go back to chapter 11, it's spoken of again. I will give them one heart, put a new spirit within them. I will remove the heart of stones from their bodies and give them tender hearts. Alex, if you would put up Ezekiel 18, and 31. This is the third note, which I just found so interesting that it was written differently. Ezekiel 18 and 31. Throw away all your sins you've committed and fashion yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why should you die, O house of Israel? Doesn't that sound different? And it's written in the same book, in the same. I don't think Ezekiel, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, was confused either. Right? I don't think he was confused as to how that all worked. Because ultimately, we have a part to play. Will you rejoice, God, with me in this verse? Titus 3 and 5. Don't spend any time on it. Titus 3 and 5. He saved us not by works of righteousness. We have a part to play, but it's not our work that gets the job done. Amen. But that we have done on the basis of his mercy, through the washing of the new birth, the renewing of the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us in full measure through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And I know part of it is just daily surrender. 2 Corinthians 5 and 14 said, For the love of Christ controls us, since we have concluded this, that Christ died for all, therefore all have died. If you would, let's go back to Acts 2 just for a moment. Because I want to make this very clear about what our part is to play. At the end of this Acts 2 moment, at the end of the sermon, it says the people heard it and they were distressed. They literally asked the disciples, what should we do, brothers? So here's the answer to our part. 
repent. Turn from our sinful ways. Turn from ourselves. We're told to be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I read behind an author, someone that I hadn't looked at in eight years, back when I was doing my master's at Regent. It's one of the most foundational things for the way I look at the Holy Spirit, of course, with the academic teaching of Dr. Hayford. But it was mentioned that the Holy Spirit, this, yes, you confess Christ and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In the early church, that was not head knowledge. That was not something that they read about, something that they taught about, something that they said, this is, you know, we got to teach you how this goes. This was dynamic experience that you confess Christ and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I thank God for good teaching, but sometimes it just gets so confusing for people. And we have to just know that simply we're to let go and just trust God. And yes, he saves. Yes, he baptizes in the Holy Spirit. But the important thing for us is we're not to get legalistic about things. We're not to get so caught up in our theology that we're the ones that are picking and choosing and saying, okay, no, you know, mm, you just you know, got, got it. You know, it's okay to measure fruit and to be diligent and wise. We have to be very careful not to play God. Acts 10 it's one of the best examples of this because the Cornelius, the Gentile conversion, is the, the main time where we see people speak in tongues before they're baptized. And there's no explanation given to it except that it was powerful. And it threw Peter back. Peter had all these reservations himself. He said, okay, God, you got a bigger mindset than I do. You got a bigger mindset than I have. And he used that, the gift of the Holy Spirit, he used the the outward undeniable signs. And I was even talking to Pastor Larry about this. It's funny because the first time Cornelius is mentioned, he's mentioned as a God-fearing man. What was God already working in Cornelius' life way before these visions happened and he brought the two of them together? I have no idea. But I think God should be glorified for the way that he works in our lives. So this morning, there's one more passage that I've kind of just ignored, and I'm going to take that as my application point this morning. But I want us all to, to know that this is for us today. So before I move on from the literal baptism of the Holy Spirit, because in, in the altar time, I think this is something that if you have never received, it's something that just by faith, I mean, you look at Luke 11, the same way you could say, okay, you come to the Lord for salvation, which is simply confessing him as your savior that's how you receive the holy spirit simply through faith and just asking like is it's that simple second timothy 1 and 6 says because of this paul speaking to his spiritual son timothy who was a young gentile pastor in ephesus this shows us this for all of us and it's for a continual working because i remind you to rekindle god's gift that you possess through the laying on of hands to rekindle God's gift. And one more note from Jack Hayford. When it speaks of being filled with the Holy Spirit, don't be drunk with wine, be filled with the Spirit. That is a continual, ongoing, the verb there is something that is, you can't just say it's a one-time thing. It's just to be, this is the way we walk. Same way people that like to get drunk, they like to get drunk all the time. We're to always be filled with the Spirit, right? I mean, that's the comparison. It's to be something that we seek and the Spirit is to influence all aspects of our lives, overflowing in transforming relationships. Transformed relationships, dynamic ministry, and enhanced worship. All these things are so true. If you've experienced it, you know. Transformed relationships, dynamic ministry, and enhanced worship, which includes a personal prayer language, what we would call tongues. And that's something that maybe you've seen it, most likely you haven't seen it because this is for that prayer closet. This is for that abiding time. Maybe in corporate worship where you don't even know who's speaking in tongues, right? But it's something that just totally 
almost like communicates the inexpressibility of God. And it, it's not necessarily something that's intelligible. It's something that's between you and God. And again, it's a mystery like the wind. I don't understand it, but I can tell you, having experienced it, thank God. So Paul said, I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. Don't quench the spirit. Don't tell anyone not to speak in tongues. Yes, there's to be order, and here's some guidelines. We're to desire to prophesy, like prophesying is something that's good for everyone. But this is still a wonderful kind of undergirding foundation for the life of the church. How many of you know that prayer is important? How many of you know I don't have all the words to pray to God, but he wants my time? And so that's where this can be a very great benefit. A great benefit. One brief moment of application before I call the praise team back up. How many of you kind of had a question with John 20 and 23? I don't know if it struck any of you as funny, but it's something that I, I, I honestly, I'm not going to say I struggled with it because I initially read it and was like, well, I'm not, I'm not going to touch that. <laughs> and it was something that I was like, okay, well, we're just going to preach it to 22 and... And maybe a week ago, I was so wide awake, it was about midnight, and I, I just could not sleep. And that's what was on my mind. And about the time I reconciled, you know, I was like, all right, God, we're going to preach it and let the ships fall where they may. What I want to make very clear is there's nothing in Scripture that communicates that that's something that we're to say, okay, there needs to be priests and that you're all to go out and go around and forgive one another's sins. Remember what I said about playing God? Like, like that's not... When we talk about the royal priesthood of believers, like this is not the application of that. But I do think you can take it at face value if you understand the weight of what he's saying. How many of you know in the Old Testament there's a sense of blessing and cursing? How many of you know there's even a component of that when you look at the great commandment to love God and then the flowing out of that to love people? Right? When we are to love people... That doesn't mean we just walk around, we love everyone, we forgive everyone's sins, everybody's going to heaven, kumbaya. Like, that's not what the verse is saying. But in the same way Jude says, snatch those out of the fire that you can, there's a sense that we're to go forward and proclaim the gospel. Yes, you have to kind of like eat the meat, spit out the bones, you know, pearls before swine. There's all these understandings of kind of the guardrails. But still, we're to walk forward, and when you are speaking God's truth, his Holy Spirit will do that work. Just like this morning, I said that my words, if it's not for the Holy Spirit, it's all going to fall flat and all of you will be asleep, right? God has to do the work. And so when we go forward, yes, forgive sins and they'll be forgiven. If you're retaining them, they'll be retained. That's just his way of saying, look, you're now commissioned to do my work. You don't replace me. Right? Jesus is this representative that we're to walk in step with, but we don't jump out in front, right? We're not the ones that it's okay, now I'm in charge and you know, I'm gonna tell you, blah, blah, blah. But we are to do the work that he's called us to do. We're to be salt and light. And so when we go out, we do carry the power of life and death in our tongue. And we're to yield that to God and to the Holy Spirit and to be wise about the things we say and to know that when you cast a curse on someone, even with the way you're talking to them, that can have an e eternal impact. And so this morning is just by way of application. Again, it's not all roses. I think the fact that people get this so wrong is because it's so much easier to say, yeah, you know, a priest can do that. That's a vocational thing. Check. Right? That's the easy way to apply this verse, and then you move on. But it's so much harder, I think, to actually accept what John's telling us and that now in the life of the church, the disciples, which again, they're the forerunners of who we're called to be. We're to be God's hands and feet in the way that we impact society. And that the gospel is to go forth and there is to be forgiveness extended with our lives and with the communication of what Jesus has done for us. And in the same way, when we don't do that, who's going to do it? I'm talking about across, or any one of us can be replaced. But if the church does not do that, who's going to do it? That's why I'm saying the promises in the scripture are so vital for the church to hold on to because we are who he has called and equipped for his good work. Praise team, would you come? This morning, 
some of this can be a hard truth, but it, it is still a simple, simple truth. Romans five, or Romans rather four twenty five. Alex, if you would have heard Romans four and twenty five, he was given over because of our transgressions, and he was raised. There was that resurrection again. He was raised for the sake of our justification. It's not because of what you've done. It's not because of how good we are. It's not because of how together we are. When you come to the cross of Christ, the life that he lived is what God sees. He looks down and says, my child, you are justified. Talking to Jesus, but you are in that place. You are in that place. And this is the same power that we're to walk in. Romans 5 and 10. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Through the death of his son. So often we focus on the guilt. And the guilt is definitely part of this. But you have to remember that we were also dead in our trespasses. We were guilty, dead, astray, and then now we have been saved by his life. Justified. God's wrath satisfied by the death on the cross. And then now raised to life in him. And the wheels to that, the motor, the engine to that, is certainly the Holy Spirit. As that picture has been given that we're to fly on wings like eagles, don't forget who carries the eagle as its source. That wind, that Holy Spirit is to carry us along. Joy, I, I know I asked for a Holy Spirit rain down, but could we do breathe again? And one more thing I would say before we go into a time of worship. And I think it's uh, Timothy 3, 16, Alex, but that's not as important as me bringing you back to the garden. This one is the garden of Gethsemane. Thank God for Jesus being dependent upon the Holy Spirit. We're looking to him as our source as we seek to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, to so just be filled with the power that God gives out, that he pours out on those that he loves. All this is possible because Jesus said, not my will, but thy will be done. And there's no way he said that out of his flesh. Out of his flesh, he said, if there's any way, let this cup pass. If there's any way, we would have all said the same thing. But in Timothy, it talks about how he was vindicated, he was raised up by the Spirit. You can see that there's this notion in Hebrews of, of him saying yes to the Father's will. And the beautiful thing about that is even though we don't understand the fullness of the Godhead, he said yes through the power of the Spirit. He said yes through the power of the Spirit. Would you stand this morning as we go into a time of worship? Oh 
If you would like to accept Christ this morning, you can continue, Joy. If you would like to accept Christ this morning, I want to give space. I don't want to rush past something that could be critically important for someone in this room. As they continue to sing, if you would like to accept Christ, please come down. come worship this morning. We end our service around the altar, the time of prayer and worship. This morning, I believe if you have never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, there's no time like today. If this is you this morning, would you raise your hand? And I will tell you, if you're nervous about the attention or whatever, just open your mouth and worship. The first time I had ever been baptized in the Holy Spirit, it was in a hotel room at a conference. And I came to Miss Carol Sunday morning after that, maybe it was Thursday. I said, Miss Carol, would you pray for me today? That'd be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I'm just not sure if it was just me or if it was... And the way God works, I was expecting this altar time, right? And she walked up during the worship set. I was up here on the risers playing the keyboard, and I was like, okay, God. And, like, and there was no doubt that it was him. It, there was no doubt it was, you know. And that's, that's just what God will do. Just open your mouth and worship him. And don't, we like to get bogged down in our understanding and our rationality, and it doesn't fit, you know, our structure and our order. But God's not worried about all that. He's put enough guardrails in place that, it, you know, it's a lot easier to throw a wet blanket on something than to get something going, right? And so don't, don't worry about that as much. Would you worship this morning? And we will take time for special prayer requests in just a moment.
Are there any special needs? Are there any special needs? Are there any special needs before we move on this morning? Special needs. All right, let's worship a little bit longer. So before we go this morning, I wanted to at least let you know this upcoming Friday is the first Friday of the month, and we've done this, done this before, but it's a special time of anointing, uh, laying hands on the sick this Friday at 7 o'clock. So if you would be willing to come out and pray, if you know anyone that has an ailment or something that's a special need, 
physical healing. This is something that we're intentionally praying and seeking God for this Friday at 7 because it's the first Friday of the month. And with that being said, we can continue just to worship. And I wanted to officially dismiss the service. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for what you're doing today. We thank you for how you're working, God. God, all over the place, Lord. God, and we just know, Lord, be it here, or people watching online, you're, you may, those that are away, we know that your spirit is with us. God, and we thank you, Lord, for how you work. We may not understand all of it, but God, but we thank you, Lord, that you're active. God, that you are alive. And we give you the praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.